Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Wampanoag, meaning people of the first light, are Native Americans of the northeastern woodlands based in southeastern Massachusetts. How did these indigenous tribes view themselves and the world around them in the period immediately preceding contact with Europeans? Eric Yanis of the Other States of America podcast reconstructs Wampanoag society in the time before the Mayflower, New England's Plymouth, and the Thanksgiving story. Popular knowledge of the Wampanoag, especially outside of New England, is completely consumed with the holiday of Thanksgiving and the founding myths we pour onto it and what it means to us today. The best comparison I can make is the historical St. Nicholas figure, the saintly person who existed in reality, versus our pop culture notion of Santa Claus. That's the gulf that exists between the Thanksgiving story and the reality of the Wampanoag who lived during that time. And I say during that time on purpose because we tend to view Native Americans as being static before Europeans showed up, and even after Europeans showed up often viewed as morally superior, but technologically backward, or at least frozen in place. And of course, that's not true at all, which brings us to the very beginning of our story. Now, for all of the Native Americans living in the Northeast, this three sisters form of agriculture, corn, beans, and squash, it actually developed quite late in their history. For one thing, corn is a tropical crop, and it took thousands of years to develop breeds that would grow further and further north in more temperate climates. And so for the Wampanoag and their neighbors, this three sisters agricultural complex only really arose within a thousand years of Europeans showing up. Of course, they had forms of agriculture before that point, but this magical combination of carbs, vitamins, minerals, and proteins were not entirely ancient to the Wampanoag, but then again, not entirely new. And so when Europeans first show up, the Wampanoag were a progressing people, just like everybody else in the world. Not static, not a frozen pitcher in time. Now you might say to yourself, okay, they had different crops, but they believed the same things. They lived their life much the same way. It doesn't appear to be so. With the introduction of corn or maize, call it whatever you want, depending on what continent you're on, the burial practices of the Wampanoag and other people, all their nearby neighbors, change suddenly. Now, something like how you bury your dead loved ones is an incredibly intimate and meaningful thing. So we can read into this a little bit. Before the introduction of corn, we see that the dead are buried. And then after a while, they're undug and then reburied in a mass grave with the rest of the dead from their community. The exact manner and meaning can't be truly known, of course. But the Huron had a similar practice, as well as a lot of other natives in the Northeast. But after the introduction of corn to the Wampanoag and their very close neighbors, their burial practices change drastically. Instead of communal graves, we have individual graves. Perhaps that denotes a, a growth of individualism, of independence, or a shrinking of the value of the community or the family versus individual freedoms. The dead are put in a fetal position, pointing west and covered with red ochre paint. Instead of this communal afterlife where they were shared with the community, the soul would go instead on some sort of journey in the westward direction. And what little we know of the Wampanoag religion, purified from all their Christian influences over the centuries, the spirit of the dead were going to voyage to the land of the great spirit, known as Kiaten or Kayaten. And there's a bunch of different variations on how to say the name of this spirit, as the neighbors of the Wampanoag had the same beliefs and slightly different dialects. This great spirit was believed to not have any sort of gender, no human form, abstract, and so was also the creator of everything. It is believed that Kiatin, Kayatin, however you want to say his name, made the first couple and taught them how to farm maize. There was also a spirit of death called Chipi, or Chepi, or Habamok. He went by a number of different names, as those types of spirits often do. And your mind, of course, goes straight to European ideas of Satan or the devil. But even early European explorers had to note that Chipi was not exactly the evil character that the Western devil would be. Among the Wampanoag and their neighbors, the name of the spirit was often synonymous with just the action of dying or the word death. So Chipi wasn't seen as an opposite of the creator, but the way I figure it more in an Eastern sense of a necessary destroyer in order for there to be new creation. Think about in your own life, 
how many times something for someone has been destroyed in the wake of creating something for yourself, not even by your own doing, just the progression of time is what happens. The Wampanoag could also call upon Cheapy as they could any other spirit. It wasn't a devil to be avoided. It was a powerful spirit that could be used to your own benefit if Cheapy so decides to help you. But he would become represented by opposites of the Great Creator. The Great Creator lives in the West. Cheapy lived under the sea to the East. Cheapy was the spirit of the winter, the cold, the night. The opposite of the summer and the harvest and the warmth and the day that the Great Creator, of course, gave to the Wampanoag people. But just like the turn of the day into night and the seasons in their course, Cheapy served as a counterbalance to the Great Spirit, not in competition, but in rotation. In addition to these two figures, there were probably as many as three dozen other spirits that played an essential role in the spiritual life of the Wampanoag year to year. Many of these spirits would be highly localized, as they will be in any animist belief. There could be a spirit of a certain forest, a spirit of a certain mountain range, spirits of lakes and rivers, all who could be helpful or potentially harmful to you. A common practice among natives of the Northeast was the use of tobacco to commune with these spirits, to offer them gifts, and to open a channel of communication. You could either smoke tobacco or light it and smudge it. These ceremonies were also essential into any sort of negotiation or a very serious, long-lasting trade deal. You want to invite the spirits into your conversation, into your bickering, into your negotiations to serve as witnesses and to help you towards your aims if you are righteous. But the most pronounced figure in the surviving Wampanoag legend stories was this giant named Mashup. Not an abstract spirit, but a physical mountain of a man, similar to the giants found in the legends of the Wampanoag cousins to the north. Other Algonquian tribes and nations, such as the Mi'kmaq people, or Mi'kmaq. But among the Mi'kmaq, their giant figure is more of an Adam in the biblical sense. He has a deep importance to the people of the Mi'kmaq. Whereas Mashap is central to a lot of their stories, but I suspect he was an even more important character. Like I mentioned before, the corn, beans, and squash agricultural complex moved in. And of course, the worship of the great spirit Kayaten who brought that corn. I would say that Mashup is a very old figure in Wampanoag beliefs and was probably more important the further back in time you went. But Mashup was a huge, huge man who would catch whales and trade them with humans for tobacco. And Mashup required so much tobacco that when he cleaned out his gigantic pipe in the ocean and made the island of Antucket, and in fact, many of the islands off the coast of the Wampanoag territory were believed to have been created by Mashup either trying to create stepping stones to get to one place or another, or as a result of some adventure or misadventure that he got himself into. Whereas some giants in the north had grandmotherly figures who looked over them and animal friends, Mashup had a wife. It was a woman named Squant, or Squayuanit, depending on where you are in the Wampanoag world. She's depicted as having long hair that was draped over her face, and she would walk on her hands and knees. And the two of them had children who were tragically taken by a giant bird that nested on Nantucket. And when Mashup went to rescue them, he only discovered their bones. In the sadness that consumed him, he smoked tobacco to console himself. So much tobacco, in fact, that the entire island was covered with a fog, a smoke that will still periodically be seen hanging over the island today. The Wampanoag believed that Mashup would protect them from this giant bird and other such horrible monsters out there in the world. And yet, as their cousins further up the coast believed with their own giants, when the Europeans showed up, Mashup left. And so in the records, when the Wampanoag come into conflict or worry about what the Europeans are up to, we often find them not reaching out to Mashup, but in swamps. Now, a swamp is a curious place. On the one hand, in the practical sense, it's a great place to hide. If you can hide in a swamp and you know your way around the swamp and you can navigate to the little bits of dry land in it, It's very hard for someone to track you down. And so in that sense, it was a place of safety for the Wampanoag, sanctuary. There was also a religious component. Now we know the spirits of death dwelled in the water, in the darkness, in the cold. And what is a swamp? It's the exact middle world between the dry land and the humans who live on it and the wet underworld of the dead. And so it was at this entryway that one could commune with the powerful spirits who could help you or at least choose to leave you alone. I'm Mark Vinette. 
and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 